artist Kate Lee recently wrote the following on Instagram. I used to focus only on what I thought I wasn't. I would only allow myself to believe the negative things I thought were truth about who I was. But something changed for Kate during a Temple Recommend interview. And on today's episode, she shares what led her to now be able to honestly write, believe in who you are, let go of your insecurities, and let light in. You have so much to give to this world, but you can't do that if you are holding too tightly to the things that hold you back. Kate Lee's art is exclusively available through Deseret Book. Through her Christ-centered art, she seeks to share not only her love for the Savior, but His love for all of us. She and her husband, Mike, are the parents of two boys and two dogs. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am so grateful to have Kate Lee with me today. Kate, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I have to tell you, for those who are listening who maybe haven't seen the videos that Kate did with LES Living, they are remarkable. I will put them in the show notes, and you can not only hear her testimony, but also see her testimony and through her art as well, which is really cool visually. But I watched those videos back. I'd watched them before, but I watched them again to prep for this interview, and I was so struck by this story that you have to offer because I think that so many people in the world right now are struggling to feel their self-worth and to feel God's love for them. And I think your story is really unique because it starts kind of with your ecclesiastical leader kind of showing you that love step by step. And so if it's okay with you, I want to start with your stake president because I love him. And if I could give him a big hug, I would do it. (laughs) Hopefully someday I get that chance. But we can arrange that. (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. That would be a dream come true. Um, But I feel like It would be great if we could kind of tell listeners what your life was like leading up to this Temple Recommend, normal, everyday. I mean, we don't get a Temple Recommend interview every day, but normal Temple Recommend interview. What was your life life like leading up to that? that. I, I mean, if you want to go all the way back to when I was a kid, but really what I carried with me really from when I was a little kid was super, super insecurities. You know, I just felt like I felt like it was a very unwanted child. And so because of that, I just, I really believed that nobody liked me, including, you know, my teachers and my friends and just the environment around me. I really felt out of place and where I was. And that was through elementary school. That was through junior high. That was through high school into my mission. I got a little better through my mission, you know, but that was just insecurities that I, that I carried with me um, for my whole life. And so I kind of just walked through life aimless up until my mission, right? And then just, I just felt like I was less important than everybody else. And that, that that included Heavenly Father and that included Christ and that it wasn't, didn't really matter to them. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so leading up to this interview, so we moved to Layton about six, just over six years ago, we moved to Layton. And I, it was about three or four months after we moved to Layton was when I went in for this Temple Recommend interview. Prior to that, I had just been carrying this heavy doubt about who I was. I was my boys were seven and nine when we moved, and I just kept telling my husband, I want to be a good mom. I wish that I could be better as a person. I wish that I could be better as a human being. I wish that I could be good enough for God. You know, like, I just don't feel like I'm good enough for anybody. And how how come Heavenly Father gave me these two children to raise when I'm not a good person? You know, and so this is the the weight that I'm carrying. I'm not good enough at anything. Anything that I've been given, I'm just not measuring up to any of that. And so— I go in to this Temple Recommend interview with the only intention of getting it renewed, and that was it. You know, I didn't have any intention of talking to him about anything. I wasn't even—I mean, that was never even in the plan to go and talk to him about what I had been carrying. I just wanted to get the recommend and get out and, you know, be done and move on. But during this interview, do you want me to talk about that? Yeah. Okay. Well, and Let's maybe move. before before we go into that, when you say, like— the way that you felt all growing up. Right. 
I'm sure that there are a lot of people listening that feel that way for various reasons. Right. What were some of the things that contributed to those feelings in your life? Growing up. There are, I mean, there are a lot of factors that play into that. I think specifically was just uh, home life for me was, for me, it was difficult. I feel like the, the environment that we were in was, wasn't the worst environment but it wasn't the most loving environment either. And, you know, I feel like I wanted to be accepted, but I wasn't accepted. I felt like I wasn't accepted at home. And so that played into other roles in my life, like friends at school. I wasn't, I felt like I wasn't accepted there. And just the people around me, you know, just different groups like church groups or I was on the basketball team. I felt like I was just the, the worst person on that team, you know. So it's just the way we were raised, was just kind of there wasn't a super it wasn't awful but it wasn't the best either mm-hmm. does that make sense yeah and I think it's interesting you you touched on the fact that you had talked to your husband about right. some of these things mm-hmm. and I'm curious like what was his response when you voiced some of these feelings because I'm right. sure that there are spouses that are like can't you see how great you right. are I wouldn't have married you if you weren't right great, you yeah know? yeah so what was your your husband's response and why do you think maybe you needed to hear it from someone else right uh, well my husband's is that, that same response. Why can't you see? You're so amazing. I wouldn't have, you know, chosen you or whatever. And and he, uh, the whole time since, you know, I mean, we were missionaries together. I don't, we can talk about that or whatever, but we were missionaries together. And so when we were, it started then, you're a good missionary. You do good things. Why are you doubting yourself? And then when we got married, it's like, honey, you're, you're so good and you're missing it. You're missing the greatness of you. And, and I would always say, thank you for being so nice to me, but honey, it's, you're, you're missing it. You know, like you're not seeing who I really am. And, and like, I just, I try, I tried to convince him I'm not good. And he would just, obviously he'd come back with these good honey. Come on, let's talk about this kind of a, you are a good person. I think because I needed to learn to trust and I learned through my stake president is what, is how I learned to trust. Trusting was something that wasn't, I didn't ever learn that growing up. I didn't learn. I learned to put up walls and shield myself because I was told negative things about who I was. And so when somebody said something positive about me, I was like, "That you're wrong because I've been told I'm stupid. And that's truth. I've been told that I'm, you know, not as important or I'm unwanted or I'm unloved or whatever. And that's truth. Why are you telling me these good things? Because those are lies. That makes sense like mm-hmm. that. So for Mike to come in and say, honey, I love you because of this, or I love you, period. That was really, really hard for me to be like, but you don't because I'm bad or I'm stupid or I'm ugly. You know, these things are things that went through my head. So it was easier for me to believe the negative than to accept the truth, right? And then anyway, I think when my stake present came in and he started telling me things, he allowed he gave me opportunities that I hadn't had before to start to learn to trust and open up about um, different things that I was too afraid to open up about. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. totally. Okay. So let's go back now to that Temple Recommend interview. Okay. So you're in this interview, run of the mill. Right. And then what? tell us what happened with your stake president. Okay. So we go in and it's just your basic, you know, questions and you get it signed and everything. And then I'm getting ready to leave. And he, he says to me, sister Lee, is there anything else that you want to talk about? And I just brushed it off. I said, no, I'm okay. Thank you though. And I tried to leave and he stopped me again. And he said, sister Lee, is there anything else that you need to talk about? And in that moment, it was like, it was like, you know, when it, when time stands still almost and you can just see the whole scene playing out, it was like one of those moments where it was like, I can talk and tell him things and and I can be vulnerable here or I can just run and, you know, not have to face this. And I knew that if I didn't take this opportunity, I would regret it. And so I just, I mean, this is all in a couple of seconds, but I just started crying. Like I just burst into tears really. And I started to talk to him about things that I went through when I was a kid and and these insecurities and these doubts and everything that I had been carrying for so long, things that I was too afraid to talk about, I started to open up to him. And it just, it was amazing. It was one of the most, like the 
not word vomit. What, what, what do you say? And you just like, you just pour everything out onto the table. It was that. And from that interview, he, he, we talked for two hours in that first initial interview and we talked about Christ and who Christ is and what he can do for us. And how does Christ feel about you, Kate? And, and, you know, my answer was, well, he, I'm the last person to be saved. He's going to save everybody else. And he'll be, oh yeah, Kate over there. Maybe we'll talk about Mm -hmm. saving her, you know? And, and anyway, we talked about these things and he said, you need to know who you are. You need to see yourself as a daughter of God and you need to see yourself the way that Christ sees you. And so he said, why don't we start meeting every week to talk about these things and essentially to heal from all the, the, these doubts and stuff that you've been carrying your whole life. And so we did, we started meeting from there every week for a really long time, for a really long time. We met probably for about four years. Oh, wow. And so it was, it was good though. It's hard, but it was good, you know? Yeah. One thing that I love about this approach is just, I think sometimes life feels so busy Mm -hmm. and maybe we don't take the time to recognize people that are struggling or that the spirit is trying to help us see that someone's struggling. We're so in such a hurry always. That's the, the pace of our lives in our culture. Right. But I think the fact that he took the time and now hearing that this happened for four years every week, like this is a a man who has his own family, Mm -hmm. his own job and and he's just right. He's doing this as a volunteer. Right. And I just think that is remarkable. And so I'm I'm cur- there are a lot of questions that I have surrounding this and I think some might hear this story and they might think well he's the stake president was not a therapist that's right right, right. but right. he he invited you he started extending invitations and we'll talk a little bit more about that but he started right. extending invitations of things to do almost like homework right and yeah. some might say you know did he overstep his bounds as a stake president for you Kate do you feel like your stake president was led by the spirit and why I absolutely feel like he was led by the spirit. I feel like the whole moving delay in happening, you know, needing to get that recommend, all of that just came at the right time that it was just Heavenly Father had a plan in store and it all came together at the right moment. I think he was, I just think if I had, if it had happened anytime sooner, I would not have been ready. My heart wouldn't have been prepared to open up in the way that it did. You know, I feel like he just was very guided and I wish that I could explain the spirit that was in those meetings. I wish I knew how to have the words or the vocabulary to explain the spirit there, but you could see when we were talking and I was sharing my experiences and stories, you could see, it sounds so cheesy, but you could see him listening to the spirit because he would take minutes to pause and he would think, and then he would come back with these answers or assignments or scriptures or whatever, and it would be exactly what I needed to hear or what I had been struggling with. And he, we hadn't, maybe hadn't talked about it in the conversation yet, you know, and he would come up or he would just have these different things, different things to say that I'm like, you just, the spirit is just working right through you right now. And you could see it right just in the moment. I don't know how, if that makes sense, but it was a really cool, I do feel like he was very guided and directed and it was just I needed it. And my husband always says, I think the reason we moved to Layton <laughs> was specifically so that I could meet with with my stake president because of the things that he's helped me with and brought, you know, he he really has led me to Christ through him taking that time and meeting with me. Yeah. What do you think it was, Kate, about him? You you mentioned that there was this moment where it felt like time was kind of standing right. still. Yeah. And But what do you think it was about him and his nature that helped you trust him enough to open up about these things that you had been dealing with your entire life? Right. I think something that I had have always craved is to have, and I apologize if I get emotional, but got um, tissues. Thank you. I saw that. I'm like, we've, oh, no. we've <laughs> made that mistake many times before. Today we're ready. Good. I, Cause I might need it. All of them actually just ask him. I think I went through like 30 <laughs> thousand boxes of tissues in his office, but thank you, Costco. Right. Just that's kidding. right. 
No, but so I think something I've always craved, though, is to have a father that was really involved in my life. I did not have that growing up. And I really don't have a good relationship with my father now. And I just have always wanted that type of relationship, you know? And so for him, sorry, for him to ask me, is there anything else that you need to talk about? That was um, really the first time that that anybody that would resemble a father figure had asked me that question. And I thought, are you really interested? And I did ask him, do you really want to hear this? Are you really interested in what I have to say and what I have to share? And he's, he's, he's of course, of course. And I, again, I wish I could describe his voice to you guys. It's just very heavenly father-like. He's just very comforting, a good guy, you know? And so I just feel like when he said to me, is there anything you need to talk about? It was just this very calming invitation that you can trust this man and you can talk to him about the things that have been on your shoulders. And and I did feel the spirit in that moment. This is your opportunity to move past what you've been carrying for so long. So I think, you know, again, everything just kind of came into every, all the things I've been carrying just all came into play at the right time. Yeah. Um, I feel like that was very orchestrated by Heavenly Father. So from there, Kate, from that first meeting, you mentioned that this went on for four years right? and that he would give you these different assignments. What were some of those assignments? Can you give listeners examples? Yes. And how did they, how did you see them changing you? Oh, they're so good. So I went through like prepping for this podcast. I went through and found my journal that I kept while I was um, meeting with him. And I wrote, there's so many assignments, so many good ones. <laughs> but some of them, I mean, a lot of them were like, go home and read these scriptures. Like, how how can you apply these scriptures in your life? Or why do you think this is a meaningful, you know, scripture for your life? So I'd go home and I'd read and I'd write. So that was a lot of them. But a few of my favorite ones were, I kept, this maybe sounds so dumb, but it was so good. It was an anger journal. And he, he, he gave me permission. He says, he says, do you ever allow yourself to feel the anger that you carry? You know, like, do you validate those feelings? And I'd say, well, no, because I'm trying to be forgiving and I'm trying to move forward. And he says, you have to feel the anger. You have to let yourself yeah. feel that. And then he's like, don't hold on to it, but feel it and then move past it. And so he he said, I give you permission to write an anger journal, you know. And so I would write down all my frustrations and everything that I had felt or whatever, everything that I was holding in, you know, and it was, it, I don't know what that sounds like, but it was so therapeutic for me to be able to validate those feelings that I had not validated yet and to put them in a journal and then to just close it and be done with that anger and to like put it aside, you know, and I did not keep the journal. Thankfully, I, I ended up, we had a big fire pit and burned I burned it. it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's what you should do with yeah. an anger journal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cause, but it was good, but that was one of my favorite ones. Another one was my sticky notes assignment, which I've talked about before. That one was actually one of my, just one of the most powerful assignments. Can you tell um, those that are listening that haven't seen that what that yes. is? Oh, you guys, it's the best. So we were in a meeting and we're talking and I was just telling him, you know, this is how I feel about myself. And he started pulling out sticky notes and he put them on his desk and he says, okay, I want you to write down what you think is truth about you. Write it down. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want you to see this. Like if you see it, then you're going to know that I'm a failure and I'm not okay with that. And he goes... <laughs> you just write it down, write down what you think is truth. And so it took me a minute, but I started writing down things like, I am stupid. I am ugly. I need to evaporate. My problems aren't worth it. You know, I'm a bad mom. And these, this is what I thought was truth about me, you know, that I, I'm worthless. And he, he looked at them and he, he said, thank you for writing them down. And he picked them up and he put them aside. And then he pulled out more and he said, now I want you to write the truth. And I, I really protest, protested with him. I said, that's truth over there. That is who I'm. That's, how, that's who Heavenly Father sees is this over here. And he, he said to me, where are you? He said, Sister Lee, that is not who Heavenly Father sees. He says, I want you to take these sticky notes home and I want you to pray about them. And I want you to listen to what the Spirit is going to teach you about who you really are. And I was scared to do that because I thought if I take these to Heavenly Father, He's going to agree with me and He's going to say, yeah, you had it right the first time. 
And so it took me a few days to, to be comfortable with the idea of praying about these sticky notes. But there was one morning when my boys had just left for school and I I just felt like, okay, I have from 8.30 to 3.30, I, I can have all day to do this. I don't, I'm not going to do anything, no pressure, you know, to do anything. I'm going to just try and get the courage it takes to pray about these. And so my boys left for school and I just told myself, do it now, do it right now because, you know, what do you have to lose basically? But so I knelt down at our couch and I just started to pray about these sticky notes and I didn't really get any words out. It was more just weeping. But thankfully, Heavenly Father knows what we're feeling. He knows our prayers. And without even trying, um, I didn't even really have to ask, you know, is this true? Is this true? Or, you know, it just was words just filled, like these positive words just filled my head. And it was just like, you are so good. You're so much more than what you're giving yourself credit for, you know? And and I tried to write down, I tried to keep up with the spirits, trying to write all this good positive stuff down. And it was just coming so fast. And, you know, it was just this moment of warmth and peace. It was just a quiet moment, but it was just like warm and like a blanket. Like when you get tucked in bed and it's really cold outside and you get a nice warm blanket on you, it's just, it was like that. It was just an amazing experience. And so I, I wrote it all down and I've treasured that. I have it in a folder, you know, and one side says truth and the other side says, other side says lies. And I just, I keep it with me often because I forget really easily, you know, what the truth actually is versus what I think is truth. And so that was just one of the most powerful for me, one of the most changing experiences, assignments that he had given to me. Yeah. I couldn't help but think while you were talking about how I wish that I could talk to the stake president. Maybe you can arrange that as well. But <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, what was this experience like for him? And what would he say about his gratitude for having had that experience and why mm -hmm. it was worth every effort. Cause I was thinking, you know, he probably was putting in work to come up with these things. I don't know. Maybe, right. maybe it just came all from the spirit, but I think <laughs> a lot of times we have to put in work. Right. Right. And I love this so much because I think that there are opportunities within the church where the Lord gives us a chance to be worked through right. and that sometimes we're the ones that benefit from that mm -hmm. more than anyone else. Right. And I think right now with the church, you know, not only do we have stake presidents and bishops and relief society presidents, but we also have right. like ministering interviews mm -hmm. now, which allows for a lot more people to sit in spaces like this right. and to have opportunities for the spirit to work through them. Yeah. And so I think it will be interesting to see how that begins to benefit people in their lives. And I think just taking that that opportunity to say, is there anything else that you need? Right, right. Is huge. Well, it is huge. And there's a lot of people that need that. A lot of people, I feel like from just my own experience, it's scary to open up because you don't want to inconvenience anybody. And you don't, I mean, sometimes it's hard to trust that somebody is really going to step up and help or whatever the, the situation is. It's really difficult to open up. And so when we can say, hey, I'm here and I'm your friend and I'm going to stick by you, what do you need personally, you know, and and to to be there for them, not just say it, hey, I'm here for you, but don't really call on me because I'm not really going to be there for you, you know, mm -hmm. but to to mean it and be there for them because that's how I feel like my stake president, he gave me he gave me his time. He wasn't, he didn't ever throw his hands up in the air and say, I'm done with this. Like we've been working together for four years. Come on, like get it already. You know, he just, he was so patient and understanding and thoughtful about it. And anyway, I feel like if we can do that for other people as well, it just, it'd be such a great movement for yeah. all humankind, not just people in the church, everyone out there needs it. So totally. You mentioned Kate that Sometimes it's easy to forget these things, mm -hmm. even years later. Yeah. And so what do you do to kind of retain these things, this this transformative experience that you had? And when there right. are moments where those doubts start to creep back in, what are some tools that you found to be effective? Um, practice. Because I feel like at, at, at first, after I did this uh, sticky note assignment, it was really easy to fall back into, oh, well, 
that was a lie. Heavenly Father was lying to me kind of thing. But it is. It was just, no, I'm going to, that's why I kept it with me so that I could reread it over and, over and relive that experience over and over to remind me that this truth. Right. But I do think it's a daily thing where we tell ourselves good things about ourselves. I think we get too much in a habit of being like, oh, my hair is this, or I'm not as cute as so-and-so, or just comparing each other, com- comparing ourselves to each other. And that that just naturally tears us down. It just naturally kind of defeats our spirits. And, and you know, I think if we can get in a habit of saying, you know what, maybe I don't like my hair today, but I'm still a good person. You know, I'm still good at this or whatever. And we focus on what the positive is. And that's what I try and do when I do get stuck in those moments. I try not to get stuck for too long, you know, like, or I'll talk to myself. You're feeling this way because why? Like what happened? What led up to this? Let's talk about that. Let's like, I almost tell myself, well, I always tell myself, let's validate why you're feeling this way, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I do talk to myself about that, but I, I always try and um, come back with, well, you're, you're still good. Yeah, maybe you messed up, but Heavenly Father still loves you and still proud of you for lots of things. And the other thing that I like to do, I have an Instagram account that I post my paintings and stuff on. I always try and leave um, a caption that is positive and that hopefully helps others feel light and good afterwards because it helps me. Most of the time I'm posting it for myself, you know, so that I can continue to work through or walk forward or whatever. But it is just... Um, just trying to lift others. But I think being positive with yourself is key. It's key to overcoming all of what Satan wants you to believe. Yeah. I think it's neat to see Kate in person for me. It's been inspiring to see because you exude confidence. And maybe that's something that you haven't always felt and obviously something that you've worked hard to get to. But I think that it's so neat to see that that is possible, even when you have thought the roughest things about yourself, that you can get to a place of confidence and strength. As as this experience, how long ago did you stop meeting with the stake president or how long, what time frame was that? I'd say it's been about a year and a half. What are we, 2019? Yeah, about a year and a half that we consistently, we still keep in touch. You know, yeah. he's currently not my stake president anymore. Okay. Because we've moved. But um, we do. In fact, I was just texting him yesterday about just different things. Life is good. We, we like our new place and that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's it's been like consistently, it's been about a year and a half since we've okay. fully met. But And how have you seen that transform or change both you and your family? Because I think that this is probably something that has affected your marriage and you as a mother. How have you seen those things? Just by meeting with him? Yeah. Um, I just think you talked about confidence, gaining that confidence, because I've been told that a lot. Oh, you seem so confident. And I'm like, really? Because I do not feel it, you know, and and I certainly don't believe that, you know, but I, I feel like that confidence, gaining that confidence in the last, you know, four plus years, I guess five years now, right, has really has changed me in the way I I am as a mother. Like, I'm not so hard on myself when I mess up as a mom because I'm not going to be perfect. None of us are, right? No. But like with my boys, I'm not as hard on myself. Okay, well, I, I said I probably shouldn't have gotten upset about that kind of thing, but it's okay. And, you know, instead of before, I would have been like, oh, I'm the worst mom. Like, why did you make me a mom? You know, I'm ruining lives here. These are children of God and I'm leading down the wrong path or whatever. So that confidence has just helped me to be calm, you know, and I feel like even just it's brought a lot of happiness. I've allowed more happiness into my life, which is great. And I've I've included God in my life, mm-hmm. which I didn't do that before because I didn't believe he was interested in me. And so now I'm like, hey, Heavenly Father, kind of, I mean, not so casually, but I do. I am, every day I try to make sure that I'm involving Heavenly Father because He wants to be involved, right? And then with with my marriage, it is, it's just, we just have a lot of fun. It's more, I don't want to say it the wrong way, lighthearted, but not so, I would, I'm not taking everything so personally. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's just, it's better all the way around because yeah. I've gained knowledge of who I really am. And I'm okay with who I am. All of my insecurities, all of my flaws, everything, I'm okay with who I am as a person. And that's just made everything lighter. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's okay. almost like a weight yeah, is completely. physically lifted. Yeah. And then and you can breathe. Right. And be happy. Right. Yeah. So 
at toward the end, or I don't know exactly what part of this four year time frame we're talking, but at right. some point, your stake president found out that you like to paint. Right. He knew that right from the beginning. <laughs> and he invited you to paint a picture for him. Right. If anyone has shopped in Deseret Book in the recent past, you have likely seen Kate's art. And it is not like something that you just do at home by yourself. <laughs> and so for you, when he invited you to to paint this picture, right. what was going through your mind? Oh and then <laughs> what did you end up painting? Okay. So it was, it was one of his assignments that he'd given to me. And the, he handed me a scripture reference during this during this time we were talking, and um, the the reference is, what is it, 2 Nephi 26, 22, I think is what it is, but it talks about the flax and cords, so that's the scripture. So he hands it to me, and he says, I want you to paint this, the scripture, and he's like, I want you to interpret it however you want, and I I said, no, I, I said, no way, are you kidding me? I'm not the right artist. I'm so not good enough for this, and he said, no, yeah, you are. You can do it, and he, he basically wouldn't take no for an answer, which I love about him. But because he does it in such a loving, kind way, you right, know? Right, So I was like, okay, okay, I'll take this home and I'll think about it. And I thought about it for a really long time. Like I did, I was so nervous. What if I paint it and he hates it? And then he's going to be like, oh, yep, she's a failure, a hater. You know, like these are all the thoughts that are going through my head. I'm not interested in her anymore. She just wasted my time kind of a thing. And it took me, so I, I got all these ideas and I started drawing it. And then I put it on this canvas and normally it takes me about an hour to sometimes up to four hours to paint a picture, not mm -hmm. super long. But this painting took me nine months to paint, like forever, because I would, I drew it and that was, that was okay because I could erase it. So it wasn't like, I wasn't committed, you know? Yeah. But once I put the paint on there and I, I paint with watercolor, but this one was acrylic. And so it was, once it was on, it was on, you know, you're just committed. And so it took me nine months to paint this picture. And it was just something I really wanted to, I prayed about it a lot. I wanted to make sure I was going to get the feeling right. I wanted to make sure I was going to get, you know, the emotion that I felt. I wanted to get it right on the canvas. And so the scripture talks about flax and cords. And I mean, up to, I, we'd been talking with my stake president and I, he's so inspired because he, he gave me the scripture reference. It talks about flax and cords and how it, it, they gently lead you down to hell. And I was thinking, my flax and cords are my doubts about who I am. And, and they are. They're, they're keeping me from progressing. They're keeping me from happiness that I can have. Like, they're keeping me from things. And so he, in essence, like, by asking me to paint this picture, he's inviting me to break free of these flax and cords. And so I'm, I want to put that emotion on the canvas, right? So I'm petrified of getting it wrong. So it did, I did, I made sure, you know, that I wasn't going to rush myself. But nine months later, I finished this painting and I was proud of it, but I was terrified to take it out of the studio to let anybody else to see it. Because then I'm like, I can be proud of it now, but what if my stake president sees it? And he's like, "Never mind. Like, you just blew the whole assignment. <laughs> like, we can't do anything now. But I took it to him and just... Again, I wish I could describe the way his reaction was and everything, he, the way he talks. He was just like, oh, my goodness, this is so beautiful. This is exactly what I was hoping for. You know, thank you so much for it. And he says, I, I want to keep it and put it somewhere that's going to just be so, so sacred for me. So, you know, anyway, just the, everything that you were saying, I was like, this is amazing. Nobody has ever reacted the, quite the way you're reacting. And it was, it was a new thing because I'm like, oh, I'm trusting. I, you know, like I can trust you with this and I'm okay with this. But during that nine month period, I also learned how to trust God more. And I learned how to trust in my abilities. Like I'd always wanted to be an artist my whole life. That's all I ever wanted to be was an artist. But I never felt like I was good enough to be the artist that I wanted to be. And I always just doubted that. And so with this assignment, it was like, I, I I kind of blossomed through it. I know that sounds cheesy, but it was just like, I started as, as this timid, shy artist. And then I, it just kind of came to like, oh, I can do this. Oh, I actually want to do this, you know? And, and I learned to just rely on 
Heavenly Father and Him teaching me who I can actually become, you know, through that. And from that painting, I gave that to my stake president. It was such a positive experience that I wanted to do more. I feel like that assignment opened up doors for me, you know, that really, like, it's, it started this momentum that hasn't stopped, you know. It taught me that I really can paint those Christ-centered paintings that I that I always craved to paint, you know. And it just was such a, again, right along with the sticky note assignment, it was one of the most powerful assignments that he'd given me because of what um, it taught me and, and how it brought me to Christ and how it's helped me to share my testimony on paper, yeah. you know, on through my paintings and stuff. Yeah. I love that so much. I So Kate has shared with us that painting. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it is not available. It's not available. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go knock on his door. He'll let you see it. <laughs> Perfect. But also we'll share it if it's okay with you. Yes. We'd love to share it on yeah. our Instagram account, which is allin.podcast. So if you want to see what that painting looks like, which is stunning, you. Um, you can look there. But I I, when you were telling that story, I got, I found myself becoming really emotional because I was thinking about how Heavenly Father gives us all talents right. and opportunities and how sometimes we may feel like, what if we bring this to Him? What if we come back to Him and we're like, this is what I did with what you gave me? Mm-hmm. And He's like, you blew it. Right. Yeah, But that I think his reaction actually will be much like your stake president in right. that it's like, this was exactly what I hoped you would do right. with this. And I think that that is such a beautiful thought. You're making me get emotional too. <laughs> but I, I think that that is what this is all about, mm-hmm. right? It that is, that yeah. God is giving us this mortal experience so that when we come back to him, he can show us his love in that way. Right. And I think that's why it's so important for us to know who we are. We have to like, I feel like the world so often tells us what we have to be. And we really listen to that too easily. Like we listen to, here's these standards that you have to meet from the world, right? And we listen to that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And and when we do that, we're really keeping ourselves from progressing or from becoming who we're meant to become. I feel like because I so often listened to my doubts and believed my doubts, I I kept myself from just being more or I kept myself from Christ. I kept myself from God. I kept myself from progression. Does that come out, mm-hmm. right? And the second I started listening to the Spirit and trusting the Spirit over my doubts, then my whole life changed. My whole perspective on what I wanted to be and who I could become changed. It wasn't, well, I can't do that because I'm not good enough. It was like, well, why not try that? Like, what do I have to lose? Yeah. You know? And I think— yeah, it's just really important that we know that we try to seek out who we are so that we, those things that we've been given, because we all have something different to give, you know, but when we seek that out and we're really trying hard to develop that, that's when we can really reach that full potential and we can have that joy because we're promised to have joy here, right? And we can have that joy if that's, you know, if, if we're seeking out those things. Yeah. For those sense. listening that are not familiar with the scripture that you were referring to, which is from the Book of Mormon, mm-hmm. I'm just going to share that really quick, and yes. then we can move on to our last yeah. couple of questions. But in Second Nephi chapter 26, verse 22, it says, And there are also secret combinations, even as in times of old, according to the combinations of the devil. For he is the founder of all these things, yea, the founder of murder and works of darkness, yea, and he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever. And then I love the next verse because it says, For behold, my beloved brethren, I say unto you that the Lord God worketh not in darkness. Mm -hmm. And I love that in the painting, again, you, you all need to go and look at this, but in the painting, you show a woman reaching toward Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. And you see her breaking free of those flax and cords. And I just think that is such a powerful, powerful visual. Kate, as we wrap up, I am curious about two things in regard to the love of God. Okay. And one of those is how did you feel the love of God through your stake president 
And what would you, what would be your advice to other ecclesiastical leaders, both male and female, who have the opportunity to sit with people in these like very vulnerable, sensitive spaces? Right. So the first one, how did I feel the love of God through my stake president? I feel like kind of like I talked about before, he was the first father figure that I really trusted in my life, you know, and that he he was patient with me and he never gave up on me. Like I said, he never threw his hands up in the air and said, I've had enough. We've been talking for so long and you're just not getting it. You know, he just, he was consistent. He was constant, you know, and I feel like because he was constant and he didn't tell me to go away. I don't have time for you right now. It really taught me how, who God was, who really Heavenly Father was. Modeling that behavior. Yeah. Yeah, Because before I had believed that Heavenly Father wasn't interested in me and, and my stake president taught me otherwise. He, he just, he taught me how to trust. I don't know. And, and to trust Heavenly Father and that I was important to Heavenly Father because I was important to my stake president, then I must be important to Heavenly Father. He just taught me how you know, the Heavenly Father is always by our sides continually, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And He's rooting Unfailing. for us. Unfailing. Unfailing. Yeah. That's a good word. Yeah. 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 He's really rooting for us. Um, your second question. Yeah. I feel like in these situations, um, it can be really easy to, because there's a lot of people that maybe you're seeing, like if it is another if a bishop or another state president or relief study president or whatever, it can be really easy because you're over a lot of people to just kind of, okay, you're okay, kind of brush them through, you know. Right. But to sit and be patient with them really to kind of almost put yourself in their shoes and what they're going through. I think of that scripture to see, right, the scripture that's in 1 Samuel, I think it's 16, 7, and it talks about how the man sees the outside, but Heavenly Father sees right to the heart. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's really what we need to see past the outside and right to the person's heart and really look out to them, but to be patient and loving and prayerful for these individuals because maybe they seem okay on the outside because like I said about earlier, people have said to me all the time, you seem so confident, but I'm not. Like on the inside, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so this, you know, and you, you, they can seem okay on the outside, but we don't know what they're feeling on the inside. And just by taking that time to be patient with them and prayerful and trying to put yourself in their shoes, you know, it can make a huge difference, yeah. a huge difference for more than just one person. Because meeting with my stake present just didn't help me. It wasn't just for me. It's helped my family, but it's also opened up doors with paintings and it's just kind of, it's right. a domino effect. And so that's so neat. <laughs> what has painting and really devoting yourself to Christ centered paintings, what has that taught you about the love of our heavenly father? That we all matter regardless of where we are. I feel like heavenly father, we talk about that unconditional love and that's, I feel like that statement is so powerful and there's so much depth to it because a lot of the time we put we put like limits on well heavenly father loves you if you're this you know but i really learned how deeply heavenly father is concerned about the person and not what we've done or you know what we're currently doing or whatever he's so concerned about the individual i think about can i share two scriptures is yeah, that okay please. i think about there's the story of Saul Paul right and we've just learned about that when come follow me he was, he had done some things that were not great, right? And Heavenly Father, I mean, could have just said to him, forget it. You have done some pretty bad things and Mm -hmm. I'm done. But he said, you know what? Let's move forward from that. I've got a work for you to do. I'm worried about who you are. I want, I want you back, right? And so he, he, he's not so focused and he's not condemning Paul for the things that he did in his past. He wants him to be able to succeed. And then I think about, I also think about Alma the Younger and the sons of Mosiah. They were naughty. I tell my boys this all the time. Think of how naughty they were. You know, and Heavenly Father came and said, okay, I love you. Let's forget about this. You know, you let's move forward. And Heavenly Father is really concerned about who they are and who they can become. And he's not so concerned about what they've done in the past. Right. Does that make sense? So right. learning through or these paintings, I've learned so much about how Heavenly Father loves every single one of us, not just people in the church, but every person on the planet. Yeah. Which is something that's been such a great lesson to see it in a different light. Yeah. 
One of my favorite things that I learned in the MTC talking about Alma and the Sons of Mosiah, kind of extending that to the Sons of Alma. Yeah. One of my favorite things that I've ever been taught about in the Book of Mormon is how after the scripture, which we all know about, yeah. if all men had been, were, and ever would be right. like unto Moroni, right. it then the very next verse says, and all the sons of Alma. Right. Which means that we're including Corianton, who was also naughty. Right. You know? And it made a lot of mistakes. But right. I think that shows the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Right. That it's for all of us. Totally. Yeah. Regardless, you know, it just people need to remember that. That we were covered. Yeah. Right. And you're not, you can't, it's so hard to get outside of the bounds of that. Right. I another thing that that reminded me of. I was just listening to a podcast the other night with Brooke Snow. I don't know if you've ever listened to her podcast, but it's very good. No, you I should haven't. you should look it up. But she talked about worthiness mm-hmm. and how our true self is worthy always, right? And that when we feel like we're unworthy, it's actually just a longing to get back to our true self. Mm-hmm. And I think that we we sometimes, especially as members of the church, can be so hard on ourselves right. and beat ourselves up. And I just have a really hard time believing that that's what God wants for right. us. And God wants us to feel that relief and that, like we talked about, that weight being lifted, Lifted, whether it's by feelings of unworthiness or feelings of doubt or whatever it is. And so, Kate, thank you so much. You have sparked so many thoughts for me and things that I want to do better. And in conclusion, what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I love that you guys asked this question, and I was thinking about it on the way down here. For me, I feel like to be all in, I need to be, I need to allow myself to be vulnerable and teachable. Um, And I need to trust the plans that Heavenly Father has for me um, because He's going to lead me down greater paths than I can take myself, you know. And um, being vulnerable is just for me letting people in or sharing my testimony or just different things like that, wanting to read the scriptures because sometimes that can be really difficult, but I need to be, anyway, to be vulnerable, to be teachable, and to be able to trust Heavenly Father. Thank you. It was perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your testimony, both through your art and with us here today. So I'm just so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is a good day. A huge thank you to Kate Lee for joining us on this week's episode, to Derek Campbell of Mix at Six Studios for all of his help in making us sound good, and to you, my listener friends, for joining me on another episode of All In. I'll look forward to being with you again next week.